Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Encounter Church. We're so glad that you're here with us. We start off every service by singing some songs. We'd love if you'd stand up with us. I'm glad you're here, Zane. I should have done. I should have listened to my own, my own advice. I'm, I'm glad that you're here, and I'm glad that you're here because we believe at Encounter every Sunday is an opportunity not just to connect with others in our community, but to connect with God. And we're hopeful about that. It's not just a normal Sunday. It's a new day, and it's a new opportunity for us to connect. So I'm glad that you're here. If you're a first-time guest, we'd love for you to download our app. It's ways to engage with us. EncounterChurch.com forward slash app. 
And you can download that and follow along in the message notes today. Follow along in the scripture. Also, one of the joys that we have um, as, a, as a pastor and as a staff, just to pray for you. It's a way that you can even go in today. Let us know that you're here. Engage with us by also letting us know how we can pray for you. We'd love that opportunity. So we're going to continue uh, to sing a few more songs. And after a few more songs, um, I'm going to be leading us today as we continue our Christmas series. And we believe that today is a good day. And I know that you do as well. So glad that you're here. Let's sing a few more songs together.
Do you wonder? What do I wonder? What do you wonder? <laughs> I wonder where I'll be in two years. I wonder if my kids are going to have a good life. I wonder why people complain all the time. I <laughs> wonder when he's going to start to lose some weight. <laughs> I wonder how he got here. Well, what do I wonder? I wonder why people are so crazy. Anybody? I mean, if I had a dollar for every time I thought, that reminds me of a country song, right? Some of you laughed. It's okay that you laugh out loud, right? Those of you who wanted to laugh. So how many times have you heard someone say, or maybe you even said, that reminds me of a Seinfeld episode. Anybody? Well, I never watched Seinfeld. I mean, I just, I know that's like maybe, maybe a few episodes here and there because someone told me to watch it. But I guess for me, when someone says, that reminds me of a Seinfeld episode, that's kind of the way that it was designed, why it was written that way, connected so many people, reminds you of so many instances, right? There's so many circumstances that you have found yourself in, right? I guess that just reminds me of a country song, right? Christmas is a crazy time of year, isn't it? And people are crazy. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> but people, people are crazy, right? And, and as, uh, even as Chris said uh, maybe a, w- a week ago in one of the messages, if you're like, I don't, I don't know, maybe I don't have that crazy uncle, that crazy family member, that probably means it's you, right? <laughs> like, I'm not, my family's pretty normal. Oh, no, it's, it's you. It's you, right? If you think you're, you're cra- your, your family's normal, it's, it's probably you. Christmas is a crazy time of year, but we love it, don't we? Love all things Christmas, and I, I like the music. Um, even when it begins November 1st, it seems, next year it's going to like precede Halloween. It's probably going to start in, in October, right? Love Christmas. I, I love the weird things that most people, or maybe not all people love, eggnog. Any eggnog lovers in the room? I buy it, and it's all for me, right? <laughs> And I love nostalgic memories, and one of those nostalgic things is something about like the Saturday after uh, Thanksgiving. If you're getting your Christmas tree like 10 days from now, no judgment to you, but you shouldn't do that, <laughs> all right? Um, I, yeah, I didn't even plan to say this. This is totally not in the notes. Have you ever seen someone with a Christmas tree like on December 22nd? You're like, for real, dude? <laughs> what are you doing? Like, what have you been doing? Where have you been? My favorite's like Christmas Eve. I'm like, are you taking it somewhere? I, <laughs> Are you grabbing it, like, from your house? And you better be delivering that to someone that can't afford it. That's, like, all these things come in my mind, and I'm like, okay, you shouldn't do that. Anyways, the Saturday after Christmas, you know, if you're on time, like me, you should go get your Christmas tree and put it up. And even someone this morning said, we're doing our Christmas tree this afternoon. And, and I, I go and get eggnog. Now, I don't do that pumpkin eggnog. Pumpkin, I don't, I don't understand. Like, what do, what's the deal with, like, pumpkin frosted flakes? That's absolutely unacceptable, right? My wife... That's for Halloween. That's right, Ruthie. That's for Halloween. Like, I'm this conversation between me and Ruthie right now. I remember my wife took a picture of the Frosted Flakes, and she was like, this is unacceptable. And I'm like, I totally agree. Now, just normal eggnog. I go and pour all my family glass, and I know that they don't want it. And so I have four glasses of it. It's kind of gross, honestly. It's one of those things that I like, but I actually confess it's gross. And I drink it not thinking about actually what it is, right? Uncooked eggs, but whatever. I like Christmas. But there is, there, there's a reality that it's not all like it seems like we want it to be, right? That the music is good, and we picture this nostalgic memory of what we've had maybe in the past, and we realize that what we really want to have an experience around the Christmas tree doesn't always live up to expectation. And what we want when we visit the family doesn't always live up to expectation expectation. In fact, one of the most common words that we actually say around Christmas is this idea of joy. And what we actually experience is different than what we actually want. Because reality 
is set in. Even the, the market side of Christmas or what we, what we hear, what we see, what we experience in Hallmark movies or at least the end of the Hallmark movie, right? It's like picture perfect. It sounds perfect. It looks perfect, right? And I joked to the, uh, some folks a few weeks ago, I know every Hallmark movie. I can tell you the story. It's a hot single dad, right? Driving, driving you laugh because it's true. He's like, it's a single guy that's went through a tough time, right? He's driving a truck somehow in the winter with his, win- with his windows rolled down. He's listening to... Country music, of course, right? But the end, but the end of it always is, seems picture perfect, right? And everything, even though life isn't perfect, it just all works out to be good one day. But the reality of Christmas is that it's tough, and it accentuates reality, and that reality is not always positive, is it? The New Zealand College of uh, Clinical Psychologists actually did a study a few years ago on the reality of emotions um, around the month of December. And the study actually highlighted two common behaviors, like human practices and behaviors, that actually produce this idea of joy. Because we're singing about joy, right? And you may have grown up in church maybe singing joy to the world. And with this idea of joy, like how do we... How do we actually experience it for ourselves? Well, the study actually revealed the two practices in human behavior that actually produce joy. This is very interesting, especially around Christmas time. You'd say, well, this is no different than January through November, of course. You're right. But this idea of thinking about it in December is interesting. Number one is actually community. Think about it. Community. Family. I mean, maybe family. Some of you are like, not my family, right? I have community, but maybe it's with a friend. So, so no matter where you find like community, this is the idea of relationships. That relationships is the number one factor of why people have joy or whether they do not have joy. It's just the idea of other people. Be it a friend, a colleague, right? A family member, your children sitting around the Christmas tree. Don't worry about the Christmas tree or the music or the eggnog or your other choice of drink, whatever that is. If it's not eggnog, right? It's the idea of having relationships and people that we love. People that love us and people that we love. The second was really surprising to me. While the first in the research, I'm like, yeah, I get it. Most of this research, you can be like, yeah, duh, right? But just think about this. Number two was empathy. Now, when I think of the word empathy, I actually don't think about joy, right, around Christmas time. But the study showed that the people who practiced empathy or responded to their empathy actually had joy. So relationships and empathy. Now, empathy is not quite as obvious as community and relationships, right? But the, the idea of uh, empathy is the emotional, listen, the emotional capacity that a person has to experience someone else's feelings. As a pastor, I naturally have more opportunity than some others to practice this. When I listen to someone's story, there is, and some, we all range in our differences in emotional intelligence, like the social cues, someone saying something, you're like, yeah, I relate to that, or I understand. Well, empathy is the emotional capacity in the brain, in the heart, you might say, right? In the brain or in the heart to understand in some like colloquial ways to say it, we would actually say it's your ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Now, why in the world would that lead to joy? Now, if we had a conversation right here, maybe Ruthie and I could continue the conversation. She's like, yeah, I will. <laughs> Ruthie's outgoing. She'll talk to me. But if we could have a conversation right now, and I would say, listen, tell me about empathy. Like, how would you respond to it? You could say things like meet their needs, right? Or help them. Right at Christmas, we have the opportunity to do this. And actually, some of you have already done this in the app. We are, you'll find in the app the opportunity to, to meet a, a child's need at Christmas this year by ordering some gifts and having it shipped here. Right? There's a information in the app about how you could do that, right? But if you could sit with that family and that child and hear their story and relate to them and connect with them emotionally and say, in some ways, I feel bad for you. And the person that's actually gone through it can say, I remember what that's like. A couple of weeks ago, I had sat down with a gentleman telling me a story that was very tough, and, and I connected. The reason I connected is because I actually walked through the same thing. You know the feeling of sitting with someone else and them, and you know they get it? They understand? It's like you almost want to just stop the conversation and give them a hug. I mean, if you do that kind of thing, right? You just want to say thank you, like you understand. It's not that empathy always shows us joy. I think what it does, and the research confirmed it, what empathy does is actually just reduce the stress and reduce the anxiety and reduce the guilt and reduce the shame 
and it opens up the opportunity for joy. So this study shows that people in relationship, in feeling empathetic towards someone else, perhaps in some of the study you could perhaps interchange the word, even though it's different, having sympathy over someone, right? Connecting with them and actually being able to respond and engage and encourage and meet their needs. These two ideas, especially around Christmas, are the things that actually can bring you joy. But the study shows the bad news of the things that actually get in the way. And there are five things that the New Zealand clinical um, study showed that actually get in the way um, of our joy. And here are the five things. I don't think you're going to be surprised by them. Number one, workload adjustment. Now think about this. Can anyone say that less is required of me in the month of December? Anyone? No. So the reality of what happens in our lives is that we have to adjust. I don't understand this, but I know this, there's research that shows that the average American doesn't take the allotted vacation time. Not show of hands, because I don't want to see your show of hands. If that's you, I'm like, what's wrong with you? Take a vacation. But I understand in some ways why it's so difficult for people to take time off. Because their workload does not adjust, right? And you still have the same expectations. So many of you, it doesn't matter if you work 23 days this month, 20 days, or however many days are in December. Is it 31? Yeah, someone's shaking their head. 31 days, right? You still have to get the work done. And so you have to adjust your workload around schedule, around time. And some of you may say, oh, i got to take off today at 3 because we have this gathering that starts at 5 o'clock tonight. Or we're going to take extended time off to, to go see family. And so you have to adjust your workload. That's not easy. Requires time, requires discipline, right? And naturally what we would feel over having to not adjust our workload properly is the idea of stress and guilt and anxiety over us. Number two is immediate and extended family expectation. Can I get an amen from everybody? Amen. amen. Some of that amen is positive. Some of that amen is negative, you know? You know what the word amen, it literally means, like, I agree, right? So if you've ever been in church, I remember growing up in church and hearing this guy in the back go, amen. I'm like, what is he doing? And what does that mean? It literally means, I, I agree. Like, it just means, hey, I agree with you. Like, I'm with you, brother. I'm with you, sister. I'm with what you're saying. Like, so immediate and extended family expectations, the number two thing that revealed stress and anxiety during this season. In the immediate family, I mean those that live with you, right? Those that are closest to you. Maybe the mom, the dad, the brother, the sister, the son, the daughter. And the expectation sometimes with immediate family and extended family, sometimes it's spoken, sometimes it's unspoken. I don't know which one you would prefer. Some of you may say, I would just prefer they keep their mouth shut and then not say what they're thinking, right? I would rather deal with the unspokenness. And some would say, no, if you're thinking, I want you to say it. That's a personality thing. There's a family dynamic and complexity there that just depends. But both are bad, right? You've, ever, you've maybe experienced when you're saying, hey, we're coming in town for, for two days. And then why can't you stay three? And then, like, you really just kind of want to say, Really? Like, I'm coming for two days. I want you to think about like, being thankful that we're coming for two days and not ask us to stay three days, right? There's the expectation that's spoken out loud. Like, I want you to stay longer. And the other person always has a point. Like, I'm just saying that because I love you. I would rather spend three days with you than two. That's what I'm asking, all right? Fair enough. And then you're into an argument before you ever spend any time together. And you're like, you're not grateful. And they're like, I am grateful. I just want to spend time with you. And sometimes it's unspoken. And I think, personally, because I'm verbal, I like to talk it out. I'm like, you thinking it, let's talk about it. I appreciate when you say I don't agree with you, because we can just talk about it. And I can convince you that I'm right. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> Am I lying? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Let's talk about it, right? Let's just talk. Let's get it out on the open. I've, I've rarely walked away from a meeting where we've been raw and real with each other. <laughs> And I'm so, I'm so glad that did not happen, right? I mean, I, I'm just, I, I want to talk about it. But sometimes unspoken is worse. Because you know there's this idea of you not being happy with me, right? And me letting you down and me not meeting your expectations is tough. Number three is crowds and traffic. Crowds and, I got some amen. Wow. All right. Amen. I mean to that too. So crowds and traffic, naturally, there's just so many people. And even those that like people, like extroverts, you know, you're outgoing, you like things, you, like, you want to be busy, you like the hustle and the bustle. We hear those words, especially around this season, that crowds and traffic actually increase an incredible amount 
of stress and anxiety. Why? Because we can't meet our expectation. A couple of weeks ago, Rachel and the boys were headed to uh, martial arts, and I don't know what's going on, but somehow everyone gets off work at like 3.30 in the month of December, right? And it literally took to go like 3.1 miles, 39 minutes, right? And some of you caused that traffic. I mean, everyone's on the road. And so she had to turn around. She called me. She said, we, we can't go. And you don't show up at this martial arts late, right? I have done push-ups for Master Derek Field if he's watching online. Thank you. I have done push-ups. I'm like, hey, that's my bag. He goes, oh, everyone does push-ups. I said, I'll, I'll give you 10. He goes, go ahead. You know. So showing discipline and being on time. Now, and I don't know if anyone else has ever made you do push-ups for being late, right? Encounter Church doesn't do that. Okay. <laughs> Could you imagine? Like, hey, welcome. You owe me 10 push-ups, right? But we just weren't, we just weren't going to uh, show up late. And literally, it just takes so long. So it can, it can cause problems in our schedule, right? Number four, overbooked schedules. I can feel some amens coming up with all of these, right? It's just too much to do. Not enough time to do it. Sometimes you want to overbook your schedules. Other times that you, you don't want to, meaning that the things that are on your schedule, you look forward to, even though it causes issues and other things. We just have so much going on. Several years ago, even though we get one week break, we decided to drive to South Carolina to see family um, on Christmas Day. Well, we were grateful to do that. It was a tough seven days because we drove to South Carolina for two, three days, and then we drove back to upstate New York to visit my wife's family in that seven days, and then came back home here in that seven-day period. And at the end of it, we were like, yes, but no. We'll never do that again, right? So we're taking a trip in January to South Carolina, right, uh, to, to see family. It's just tough, right? Overbook schedules. And finally, financial pressure. The highest spending month um, in not just our culture but around the world is the month of December. Even when you talk about the budget, sometimes you talk about the budget and you say, hey, we need this much extra. Even those of you that may plan monthly all throughout the year, do you ever spend less than you intend to spend? Rarely. It's always more. It's like when you set a budget for a home renovation, it's like the baseline. Right? Even when we, when we designed this space, we had someone very wise and helped us, an engineer. He goes, remember, this is what we call baseline. You're not going to come up below it. You're going to come above it. There's something called a contingency budget, and then you're, you're going to spend that, right? It's always more than you anticipate, rarely less, right? So, Merry Christmas, right? <laughs> the first Christmas was full of struggle. The first Christmas was full of wonder, right? And in some ways, we can say, what's going on? Right? Whether you're with family when you say that or when you look at your schedule, you try to make it to martial arts, you have to turn around because you're 32 minutes late and you don't want to walk in 32 minutes late of a 45 minute class. Right? It's just, it's hard. And, and so many things can get in the way of us experiencing community and relationship. So many things can get in the way we think about us and rather than we're thinking about other people and their needs or feeling empathetic or feeling sympathy towards other people and what they're going through. We just can often be consumed and think about us, and we wonder what is going on. Mary and Joseph, the mother of Jesus and the father of Jesus, had a lot of wonder. And in fact, their wonder, I can't imagine what the stress and the anxiety was like for them. Just last week, as, as Chris, um, our pastor, be, began the series, um, he brought up the I idea of in this faith that we believe in, in the, the Christian faith that that the mother of Jesus was a virgin and even last night as I'm reading this Josiah comes up to me and says daddy what are you reading and I said so I read it to him he goes what's that mean and so we of course talked about this, this story and just reminded him about the miracle of the mother of Jesus being born a virgin but the reason I'm going to get into the story in just a few moments in Luke chapter one but this was a stressful time and it was a time where they didn't meet expectations of family members, right? Where they had things happen to them where they had to leave town and not tell anyone what was going on. No Instagram posts, right? Giving them updates of where they were going, what they were doing. No family text messages. In fact, they had relatives that were, that were also pregnant. She went and basically hit out with a relative named Elizabeth. Why? Because she needed to escape. 
And so while we look at the nativity scene and we see this miracle that Jesus was born, that this was a time of joy, let me tell you, folks, it's supposed to be a time of joy. And I want that for you. I want, I want the peace. I want the, the slowness of this season. And I want the community. I want you to feel empathy and connect with others that are in need and help meet those needs like Encounter Church looks to do this year. But the reality is that so many things stand in the way. For Mary, some things stood in the way. I'm going to read from Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. I want to recap some of the miracle of this story. So Luke chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 26. It'll be on the screen. It's also in the app if you connect that way. Verse 26, Luke chapter 1. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. I'm going to give some commentary as we go along. Elizabeth was a relative Elizabeth also had a miracle birth. Now, we always talk about the miracle of, of Mary during the Christmas Eve, giving birth to Jesus, though she was a virgin. But there's another miracle that happened. Her relative became pregnant in her old age. We're not sure exactly how old she was, but she was very old. In fact, when she told her husband what was going on, and the angel appeared to her husband, Elizabeth's husband, He did not believe. He was in doubt. In fact, she was six months pregnant. So there were two miracles. Elizabeth gave birth to John the Baptist, right, who paved the way for Jesus. And so John the Baptist was six months in utero when this happened to Mary. Okay? Verse 27. To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. We'll stop there for just a moment. There's two incredible things that happen in these verses and that are stated that we want to capture. One comments that she was a virgin and that she was coming from the line of David. Okay, so the two words, virgin and David. Virgin. Can we say that that's, can we understand why that's pretty notable, right? It's a miracle, right? And we're about to understand part of that miracle. But the unique part of what this was, this was a statement of the fulfillment of this prophecy. In fact, if you have time later on, you can go to the very beginning of this uh, chapter, Luke chapter 1. Luke was a doctor and was noted by other first century historians to be a very, very sharp man, right? Sometimes you don't think your doctors are sharp. I understand, right? You're like, are you, did you go to school for this? Like Luke was noted as a very sharp man. He actually starts the beginning of this very chapter basically saying, I did my homework. I checked all the facts and I got something to say. I love it. This is how this actually starts in Luke chapter 1. And he presents this to a Roman leader named Theophilus and says, Hey, Theophilus, here's an account. Like Luke wrote down a blog of the history of this man named Jesus. And you know what he says? He says that that, that Jesus was born of a virgin and he came from the line of David. These were the two prophecies, two of the many prophecies spoken of the Messiah that was to be born. So this was a statement that this boy, baby to be born named Jesus, is a fulfillment of hundreds and hundreds of years of prophecy. Because he was going to be born of a virgin, and he's going to come from the line of David. Now what's interesting, if you compare that to another book in the Bible, the book of Matthew, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All four different accounts of the life of Jesus, from his birth to his death and resurrection. Matthew Part of as a kid, I remember like hearing some of this stuff. And even in seminary, I'm like, why are we reading this part? Can we just jump to chapter 2? Chapter 1 of Matthew gives the lineage from Abraham all the way to Jesus. Right? This is incredible. There were 14 generations from Abraham, the father of the Christian faith. Right? Abraham. Abraham to David, there were 14 generations. And every dad in the line is mentioned. He was his son. He was his son. He was his son. He was his son. From Abraham to David, 14 generations. And then Matthew takes it from David all the way to the, to the uh, Babylonian exile. He mentions he was his son. He was his son. He was his son. He was his son. Guess how many generations? 14 more. 14 more generations were mentioned in the Bible saying, hey, listen, here's the lineage. So In the first chapter of Matthew, you would read it and go, this is boring. Let's go to chapter 2. Let me tell you why it's not boring. It's proving that Jesus was a fulfillment of the prophecy, right? He just said, hey, this was, he comes from the son of David. Well, guess what? And then the gospel of Matthew, he articulates 
14 more generations from the time of the Babylonian um, exile to current day to a man named Joseph. He was his son. He was his son. He was his son. So there we have 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the exile, 14 generations from the Babylonian exile all the way to Joseph and said, here he is. <laughs> this was a statement that he would come from the line of David and guess whose great, 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 great grandfather is, right? I didn't say grandfather 14 times. Forgive me. I just couldn't count that way, <laughs> but it was King David. So that's a huge verse there, right? I mean, that verse, and remember Luke said, I did my homework and guess what I found, right? It's the same thing that Matthew said. He came from the line of David. Verse 29. This was not good news to Mary initially. Verse 29 says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words. Mary didn't appreciate the genealogy, right, or this this promise. right? She just knew that she was pregnant and that she had never um, been with a man. She was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Verse 30. But the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel said, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Mary was living in a day with very powerful men. And I'm sure this was very scary to her. In fact, those powerful men got rumor of this pregnancy months later. And what did they do? They got rumor that the Messiah was to be born from the line of David. They were not ignorant to the line of David, to the lineage, and to this prophecy. They understood. They were educated. Some in political power would have even went through the school where they would have to memorize certain portions of of the Bible. They understood that there was a Messiah to be coming, and there was rumor that he was going to be born soon. And so one of the reasons that Mary and Joseph fled was the idea that this Messiah was going to be coming, right? Right? And so there was an issue decreed that every male child below two years old was to be killed. Now, this was my Tuesday morning conversation with my boys, right, the other morning. And so we came to the story, and they were like, wait, 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 what did you mean? Josiah asked them, so I told them the story. They were like, stop eating their breakfast. They're like, really? And then I said, Merry Christmas, right? (laughs) It's it's not all good, right? I'm like, so what did they do? I'm like, "They, they fled, right? But some of you want to do right during the time of Christmas and just be with your spouse and be with your kiddos and you just kind of want to flee and get away. Mary wanted to flee. And she said, how can this be? How can I, being a virgin, how can I get pregnant? And he said, the power of the Most High will overshadow you and it will be true. Like was mentioned last week from, from Chris, that this would have started a roller coaster of emotion. A roller coaster of pain. Why? Because it was not welcomed or accepted at all in this day to be pregnant unless you have gone through your kind of uh, uh, your betrothal period and gotten married. It's not okay. It's not okay to, um, to engage with a man before you get married. Right, And she would have been publicly ridiculed, not just privately, not like talking you know, behind her back. No, no, no. It would have been a public ridicule of her and how she had um, supposedly been living. In fact, Joseph, as mentioned last week, just to build on this for some of you that may have not been here, Joseph had this idea that quietly he would separate from her. Why? Because it wasn't accepted. And he, too, was an honorable man, just like Mary was an honorable woman. He said that this isn't acceptable. And so God gave him affirmation that, no, 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 don't do this. Like, I'm doing something, right? I'm sending you the Messiah. And in faith, he stayed with Mary. And they took the pregnancy or or, or took this betrothal period. She stayed pregnant. She left. What did she do? She went to go be with her cousin, who was also pregnant. And so she left. During this time, though she could have been in ridicule, she could have been in shame, she could have turned her back, she could have denied. This idea in Luke chapter 1, we see from Mary that she was wondering too. She was wondering what was going on. Like you find yourself in seasons when you're like, I want to have faith. Like I say that I have faith, but I don't believe right now. I'm doubting. 
Like, I want to have faith, and you can fill in the blank with what you're doubting right now or the struggle that you're going through. I want to believe the best in this. I want to believe the best in my relationship. I want to believe the best in my son or daughter, but I just down, and I don't, and I'm doubting. She had every reason to continue her doubt. She wondered in amazement where she thought, what is going on? And in the season that was supposed to produce joy and is supposed to produce joy and happiness for you and I, we get bogged down, just like Mary could have. But I love a few verses later, and this is what I want to read to you and kind of capture in just a few moments. Mary describes something that's incredible. Like she goes into, and I'll read it to you in just a few moments, she goes into like basically this song that she writes and that she sings to God. You ever been amazed by someone's faith during a tough time? I've had the challenge, but also the privilege to be in hospital rooms that no one wanted to be in. When you hear the faith of someone that's strong, you admire it. You look up to it and you respect it, right? And I've heard even just this past week a way that you can pray if you think of it and pray for my mom who may be listening to this. She told me last week that there's um, you know, just some tests going on for her that they're looking at. They don't know what's going on. She, and she basically just said, hey, listen, I have faith. I, I do. I have faith that, that, that God is with me and that God is for me no matter the result. Right? I, just, I have faith. And you just listen to that and you go, wow, I'm glad. I'm so glad, right? And Mary, during this season, even though she, she fled, she fled for the right reason, right? She got into seclusion. She got into privacy. She did not doubt, but she expressed her faith in God. Check out these verses right here. Luke chapter 1, verse 46, just a few verses later. Mary says this, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Now, the first thing out of my mouth and the first thing out of your mouth in times of tumultual, like, I guess uh, in, in what you would describe as tumultuous, right? Terrible, awful, like not ideal, not something I ever want to go through again. One of the first things that kind of overflows in our hearts, not my soul glorifies the Lord, Right? It's just not natural always for us in the midst of struggle and in the midst of strife to say, you know what, on the inside, I'm good. (laughs) Most of the time on the inside, you're like, I'm about to explode, right? Because the emotional tank is low, right? The patience is gone. And sometimes maybe you've experienced what Mary experienced, but people say things about you that are not true. And people don't even understand the faith that you have. Some of the toughest conversations I've had in family are regarding faith and faith differences. People that don't understand your faith. If you have faith in Christ and you're, you're a Christian and you're following God, maybe your parents don't understand. And so there's this disconnect that Mary and Joseph took a step to say, we believe in God. We believe in what the angel said. Like the angel appeared to them and both told, were told separate things at separate times, and they both came together and said, yeah, you talk, yeah, I did too. Well, yeah, okay, this is God. God is speaking to us, and we're going to show our faith in him. And in a time of ridicule, in a time of shame, in a time where they could have, could have basically said, yeah, I'm not sure what you're talking about, they stood up, and they faced it. And she said, my soul glorifies the Lord. This idea of the angel is captured um, all throughout Scripture. And just last week, kind of almost as a side note, I, I think it's interesting to think about angels. Where are they? What do they do? Now, this isn't a series on angels, but I just got to tell you, this was asked to me a couple of times last week at different times and in different ways. And we see the angel appearance uh, to Mary in this story. And we see it later to Joseph as well, right? The idea of angels are, are interesting. There's, there's two words that we pull from. When we say the English word angel from the Hebrew to the Greek, there's different meanings in the languages that we read the Bible. 
As many of you might know that the Bible was not, of course, written in English. It was written in different languages, which is often in biblical teaching. While you hear people say the Hebrew says, right? You ever heard someone speaking English as a second or third language and you hear them and you go, that's close, but that's not quite it. You know, it's kind of sometimes laugh, laughable when you hear, ah, OK, I know what you're trying to say, but that's not quite the right word. Right. Um, there was a Chinese restaurant when I was at the University of South Carolina called Yummy Restaurant. I'm like, no, nah, I don't think that's like the right word. Right? Yummy. Yummy is a good word. But I don't know if you would call it that if you, English was your first language. Right. There's just some disconnect. Right. Yummy's OK. I guess if you want to name your restaurant that you're planning yummy that's fine no judgment to you right but that's not quite it well in in the in the uh hebrew and in the uh, greek languages we understand the idea um angel to mean a messenger right we also mean uh, and understand the idea of angel to be someone who who accomplishes a task right someone who's carrying not just a word but someone that's working so the new testament makes a few references to angel this incredible verse about angel says be careful how you entertain strangers because you may be entertaining an angel that we have this idea and belief in the in, in the christian faith that the angels though we do read descriptions of this in the old testament of angels having wings and angels being described with multiple wings these glorious beings that work for god we also see throughout the scripture that there's an idea of angels being present. They're real like you and I, right? They're people that are working on behalf of God, right? And the angel, archangel Gabriel and Michael, these are described throughout, throughout uh, scripture and even some of their physical descriptions. But they have very real experiences with people that had a message from God himself. But here's the, here's the bad news for Mary and Joseph. No one else saw it. No one else saw it. This is private. You've seen those movies where you're, like, you're watching a character tell a story and you feel empathy for this character. You feel bad for them because like no one else saw it. He's like, no, you don't understand. You don't understand. You don't, no one believes me. And talk about the frustration of knowing that no one else believes me. My son, he gets fired up when I don't believe him. And then I found out that he's actually right. And I kind of thought he was a liar. And I feel like a terrible dad. It's only happened to me once in my life. But, like, I feel really, really, really bad for him because I, like, think he feels like I'm a liar. He gets, you know, just gets upset. And I understand. Like, no one likes to feel like no one believes them. This is where Mary and Joseph were. Like, they had these experiences, these real experiences with God. And yet no one else saw it. This is why Luke begins this very chapter by saying, I did my homework. I did my study. This happened. It's real. Generation after generation after generation after generation. And guess who's next? Joseph. Guess who's Joseph's? After 14 plus 14 plus 14 generations, guess whose name is there? Joseph. Guess who his son is? A little boy named Jesus. Guess who named him? Not Joseph. Guess who named him? Not Mary. Sorry, Mom. First kid, you didn't get to name him. Right? Right? Jesus, his name will be called Jesus, and he will be the king. He will be the deliverer. His kingdom will never end. How about that to a mom's ears? His kingdom will never end. Like, yes, my boy, that's not what happened. Like, his kingdom will never end. Really? He's going to overthrow the people I know? Like, what's, what's going on? And in spite of all that, in spite of all the stress, in spite of all the anxiety, she says, my soul glorifies the Lord. Now, true joy. Finally, I want to tell you three things. I really do believe that in spite of whatever you're going through, in spite of what seasons you find yourself in, in spite of the difficulty, in spite of the complexity. I've heard stories of recent, and I'm like, I don't know. I know you came to me to ask me what I think, but I can just say, I don't know. It's so complex. It's so hard. What do we do with this in spite of everything? True joy, we believe, does not come from your circumstance. And I can say this, it can't. If you're waiting for all the other external things to just line up right, to make you quote unquote happy, you'll be waiting for a long time. You can pursue happiness. Happiness is different than joy, right? In some ways, we can just say that happiness can be a a responsive emotion. Someone gives you a gift and it makes you feel happy, right? But then some of you may say, I don't need any gifts and I feel happiness, right? It's just the difference in our, in our in, in, in emotional state of feeling joyous. And this is what Mary said. My soul has joy in God 
because I have faith in here. People can say what they want to say. People can say, yeah, right, between you and Joseph. Like, I know the reality. See the baby bump? You have a baby. That means you were with another man, right? I, I, she said, my soul glorifies the Lord. So where does it come from? True joy flows from these three things. We see it in this story. A sense of inner joy. Not from the outside. But true joy flows from a sense of inner joy. Joy, and you can have that. And true joy, we see from this story, also flows from rejoicing in what God has done. It's not the what have you done for me lately, right? But it's really honestly believing that God has done great things for you, that looking at the positive rather than the negative. All of us can focus on the negative, then all of us can drown in the negative. But true joy flows from focusing and rejoicing in what God has done. That's exactly what Mary does in these verses. She goes, I see what you've done for me. And I see that you care for me. I don't know what other people are saying about me. I see the goodness. And this is what she says. I see what you've done, God. Think about today if you took the time to do that. And finally, true joy flows from a humble, grateful heart. Realizing that you don't need anything, but you have everything you need. I don't need anything else, but I have everything I need. Some of you might be gift getters and gift getters, right? But I think most people at some time have experienced a true sense of inner joy. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what you do or what you get, what what you receive. You know that moment when you're just like, life is good, right? Life is good. It's not perfect, but man, it's good. Mary, in the most tumultuous season of her life, said it, and she sang it to God. She sang it to God. My soul rejoices in the Lord because I see what you have done for me. And finally, she said, God, you've chosen me and I don't deserve it. She had that humble heart. And this Christmas, if you see what Jesus has done for you, what God has done for you, and if you see that God is for you and that he loves you and that he cares for you, and you recognize with a humble, grateful heart (laughs) that life is good, So much of the other things that cause the stress, the anxiety, the worries of this life can fade away. And I believe that can happen for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the example of of Mary and Joseph, that we see, God, that even though she was in a tough time, even though her family didn't understand, some of her relatives did not understand, some of them did, that she was in a season of ridicule and shame and embarrassment and worry. But in spite of all of this, she believed in you. So thank you, God, that our faith in you can give us joy. That our our faith in you can give us peace. Our faith in you can give us humility. Where we truly realize that you are great and that you have done great things for us. So many of us in this room, God, I know, are in different places in the journey of faith. For those that have faith in you already... May it continue. May it strengthen. And may during these next few weeks, God, we realize that that you love us and that you're for us. And for those of us that are exploring and they're curious, may they realize that you, Jesus, are the greatest gift ever given. That it was Mary's faith and Joseph's faith that paved the way for this miraculous birth. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for what you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In these next few moments, we're going to sing a song together. And this song is is really designed and a part of the service to give us space, space to respond, space to sing. You'll also see in the the next few moments an offering basket will be placed uh, and and, uh, passed throughout uh, the auditorium to and from, left and right. That's a time where we can be generous and give back to God. And we encourage you to do that, as some of you have heard before, that during this season, we're taking a Christmas year-end offering that will really culminate on uh, Christmas Eve, on our Christmas Eve services, that 100% of the dollars that go into that will be given out. And we're excited about the ministries and the opportunities that we have uh, this Christmas to be a blessing. And by the way, you were a blessing last week to several families. You were a blessing last or two weeks ago to several families. Why? Because you give. So thank you for giving, and we're able to do so much in people's lives because of your generosity. If you're a first-time guest, your gift can be passed in the basket to the person beside you. And uh, we look forward to connecting and meeting with you. Let's stand and sing. 
our final song together. As you may notice uh, that our pastor is not in the house today because he is officially Dr. Causey. So make sure, make sure next week that uh, you congratulate uh, Dr. Causey, our pastor. Um, as some of you have known, if you're here for the first time, you'll realize the last several years, or maybe more than a few several, it takes a long time to finish one of these degrees. He's worked hard. And so... He's uh, in Louisville, Kentucky with his family this weekend. So we'll make sure to congratulate him. And be sure to c congratulate uh, his wife, Jenny, as well. She has definitely given a lot of love and support to him. So she gets an honorary doctorate, right? <laughs> 
Yes. So thank you again for being at Encounter Church today. We hope today's message that Jason shared with you gave you a new perspective on where your joy can come from. It comes from within, and it can really change how you look at your life and your circumstances. Um, As you leave today, feel free to stop by Starting Point if you have any questions about who we are. Also, if you are not receiving our weekly emails, um, Encounter sends out a weekly email with updates, um, important things for you to know. If you are not receiving that, please let us know either through the app. You can give us your email that that way, or at Starting Point, you can let us know because we always share important information each week. All right, we hope to see you again next week as we continue this series. Until then, have a wonderful Sunday. Take care.